difference of Swedish and English? Oh, languages. Yeah, well, and culture, particularly, well, particularly Swedish, because when Swedish people speak English to English people, they speak Swedish and English. OK, I mean, I mean, you're a linguist, you get this. So anyway, what what I. In Sweden, I'm regularly accused of being a liar. And if there's one thing I'm not, I'm not a liar. And it really bothers me. But what I've figured out is that Swede, Swedish is built on the accusative clause. Um, um, and they've only got one word for liar, lie, which is lurga. I, and so I've, basically, I've just started writing a piece called the Nobel lie. Um, and I like it already. <laughs> um, Harold Pinter famously said, here we are, the majority of politicians on the evidence available to us are interested not in truth, but in power and in the maintenance of that power. To maintain that power, it is essential that people remain in ignorance, that they live in ignorance of the truth, even the truth of their own lives. What surrounds us, therefore, is a vast tapestry of lies upon which we feed. Harold Pinter, Nobel Prize lecture uh, for literature, 2005. Now, Basically, the theme of this piece I'm going to write is going to be how the pandemic has been dealt with in Sweden and how it's been dealt with elsewhere. And my premise is that the Swedish government simply didn't need to lie to its people. Um, and the narrowness of uh, a nap there's a narrowness of, of, of understanding truth in Sweden because of the consensus culture. And it's much easier for everybody to be on the same page in Sweden. There's a documentary, which I'm going to dig out for this piece, where a Swedish economist is being asked by an American economist, why don't we do the Swedish way in America? And uh, what she basically says is it wouldn't work because there are only nine, 10 million Swedes. I mean, the, including new Swedes, there are about 11 million, less than 12 million Swedish people or, or people within the Swedish um, uh, sphere of influence. Then, And the, 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 the and, and a lot of those, well, a million of them are in Stockholm or so. Um, the vast majority of them are in either Stockholm, Gothenburg or Malmo um, and, and London, strangely enough, the, 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 the expat Swedish community in London is one of the largest Swedish communities in the world, including in Sweden, because obviously, yeah, um, Distribution. Stockholm is a beautiful city, but it's actually quite small. I mean, it is. It, 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 I, any, anyone that wants a weekend break should go to Stockholm because it is beautiful. Um, and visiting Sweden is not half the uh, slog that that actually living here for eleven years is. Uh, it, it's it, obviously to visit a place you don't have to be as cognizant of the culture I mean, i've always said i'm the most ungrateful immigrant in the world i mean you know i i, I really am not a good immigrant in sweden uh, I, 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 and you know i i haven't learned the language property properly and all the rest of it but I, I i understand enough of the language and the culture to make these linguistic points so basically um one of the biggest noble nobel lies is the Nobel Prize for Economics. Now, that one's always funny because that's not even, it, it's a different thing. It, it, it's the Danish Academy um, and, and it's an invented Nobel Prize for economists. Alfred Nobel um, never did a prize for economics. It's a completely separate thing. Um, I, I'm not sure how many people know that. People should know it, but but it, it's the, the greatest Nobel lie is the Nobel Prize for Economics. Uh, which I think is funny. So the, then there are a couple of other things I'm going to cover. Hannes Alfen is a famous um, plasma physicist. He's dead now, but he was um, uh, in a uh, Hoyle, the famous astronomer, 
um, did a, a, pro, pro, a, a series of science programs in which he's talking to Hannes Olfen, and they both have theories of plasma, uh, magnetism, and the electronic universe, which are not simpatico with the dominant narratives in the statistical turn in physics, okay, which, which people like me contend is a mistake. Um, and, well, and more importantly, people like Claire, um, another Swedish guy now, Klaus Johnson, who's the professor of applied mathematics at KIT. Uh, and he's one of the, he, he is Sweden's most cited academic. Uh, and he's on the naughty step because he's a um, CO2 uh, skeptic uh, in terms of the green global um, policy narratives. Now, Hannes Alfin actually gave two Nobel Prize uh, lectures because he won two Nobel Prizes. And in both of them, uh, he's quite interesting on some of the academic um, truths which take a while to, 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 to shake through the system because people build careers on mistakes. Um, and uh, lots of careers. I think one of them is going to be the Higgs boson, which I think is a complete nonsense. Um, you know, when people build their careers on on, on theories uh, which turn out not to be true, they find it very difficult to let go of them. Um, and and whole departments have built lots of funding is 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 on the line because of it. And the peer review process does not actually lead to advancement of knowledge when you get dogmas becoming ingrained into scientific thought. And that's a very interesting take on following the science, following the data and not the dates, and some of these narratives which are basically pseudo-scientific surrounding the pandemic. Um, and it's an interesting juxtaposition that the Swedish government has followed the science more. Um, there's a guy called Andesh Tegnell, and Andesh has followed the science and the um, the dominant theories in, in, in epidemiology before COVID-19 came along, or SARS-CoV-4, or whatever they're calling it now, um, like the Nepalese mutant variant or whatever i mean it's um he, he's stuck to his guns and a little bit like brexit uh, he's a marmite man in a way people in sweden either love him or hate him um but but for me he's the best of the sort of swedish kind of um uh was he the one that a sort said of, sort everyone of should be allowed to live their own life uh, he's probably said a lot of things Ranja and I haven't heard that one, but you know, I mean, I'm uh, like I say, I, 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 I've listened to some of what you said, but I haven't followed this but whole COVID thing. He is the Swedish okay. yeah. head epidemiologist, who, and it's his responsibility. His is not a political appointment, and that's the point. Um, so, anyway, the, I mean, there are several things that I'm going to go over. Hannes Alfin's one, one of them, and 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 his criticisms of of physics. Um, then I made a video about live and let live, smark and air on bark, and which, which is basically opinion is like the arse divided. That, that's the Swedish saying. And Johanna said to me that that that's the Swedish equivalent of yeah, I remember um, you telling me that of live and let live. Yeah, and and, and that doesn't really in Sweden. They, there's no live and let live, and that's another reason that the pandemic has been able to be handled here differently. Another reason it's been able to hand, be handled differently is cash virtually doesn't exist in Sweden anymore. It's all touch cards, switch cards. Um, obviously, well, not obviously, but uh, Lund University has been implanting people with, you know, chips and stuff. And you've got idiots lining up to get themselves chipped because they somehow think that's that represents freedom. But it, it's it's free. It, what it is, it's like freedom from the yoke. And instead of a. Uh, you know, an, a, a, the sort of yoke they used to put on oxen. Uh, the, the new yoke is an electronic yoke. It's a, a chip they put in your arm and it's, a, you know, no less a yoke than the yoke they put through around the necks of oxen in, in, in medieval times. So that that's that. 
the other point is the number of words in the Swedish language. And there's 43,000 current words in Swedish, 136,000 in, in English and something like 300,000 uh, non non regular words that are still known and in usage. So um, that, that's the point about, well, there's a, one word for lie. Uh, in Swedish, the French have got loads, uh, so I like that one. I haven't looked at the Spanish yet or the Italians, but I mean, the Italians give us Machiavelli, of course. Um, and in Sweden, this is the joke about Sweden always is is the naivety. It's always the big breasted Swedish blonde that that is sort of, you know, oh, well, of course, I, you know, I'll sleep with you. All those sort of the Swedish jokes, the jokes about the Swedish kind of yokel attitude sort of thing. Um, and it's it's a linguistic thing, really, I think, because, um, as I say, I, I'm absolutely fed up of, of being called a liar, but they're not meaning a liar in the lying sense of a deliberate truth. Uh, but they haven't got the subtleties of an honest lie, of, 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 of a misspoken word, of a, um, a statement made but that one believes to be true because if you make a statement that you believe to be true that turns out not to be true that isn't lying in english so that, they're, that's they're, something they're, else so, they, so, so what they're doing is they're taking the intention out completely and exact, making it sound as though you have that's right and and johanna just i had a conversation with johanna just now and she was basically saying well all humans are liars of course they are so that that's fine to do that. And I said, well, actually, it's not. And, and in English, people get offended. And I said, you know, I've, I, I've really thought about this. And that, that that's a root cause of quite a lot of, 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 uh, of, of dissatisfaction for me in terms of how our relationship goes forward, because um, but it, I mean, it just happens. It happens with my children as well, because they if, if something that one would want to happen or thought was going to happen doesn't happen that's a lie rather than a change of circumstances but the only word available is lie and so when it's used they know what they mean by it but in my english language brain it's like well no that's a mistake it's a mistake. Well, i i remember yeah i remember when i asked you when we were doing hartlepool and you mentioned burke and you said um, he believed in representative representative government and not delegated government. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I thought, because of the build up that you'd given me about what delegated was, mm -hmm. so I basically said something along the lines of, yeah, not these words, but along the lines of, what an absolute cunt. And, <laughs> and you, although you didn't say, yeah, quite right, that is the meaning of what I said, you actually said, no, look, Runjan, what he said had an intention in a certain way at a certain time. You know, you didn't have to say there was good stuff about what he was saying. I recognised at that stage that there must have been. But you you pivoted slightly. You made me pivot slightly because instead of me just going, right, OK, black and white, he's against delegated, he's for a representative, he thinks the lower orders are dumb. You know, what a cunt. Uh, and, and then you sort of just nuanced it up for me. So, so I sort of said, right, OK. But I was ready to kill him. But the point is about the nuance and the intentionality is and also changes in the circumstances. Um, is. That the narrowness of allowed interpretation that we've seen um, in in the pandemic it's been narrowed down, it's not been opened up. So th that's the stack exchange versus the discourse point. Um, and so, and, and it's also David's point about starting assumptions in any argument. I read rebranding dissent. Logical argument, not, not, not bust up, but you know. Yeah, any, I, any I read rebranding dissent this morning, by the way. Uh huh. Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why separately, because you know, we're talking about this now, but yeah. Yeah. Can I just repeat what I've heard you say to me? Mm -hmm. um, the noble light uh, reference no, to Nobel light. <laughs> I pronounced it wrong. I've written yeah. it with E L. Uh, yeah. The Nobel light, um, and then you know, obviously, you touched on the accusative uh, liar. 
and one word for lie, but that's later. You mentioned Pinter uh, about the tapestry. Uh, funnily enough, in 2005, I assume October when he accepted it. Um, then economics, the Danish thing, mm-hmm. the Danish origin. Hoyle moving into Hannes Elfin and the idea of it taking a while to accept an idea. And you talked about um, departments being built on, you know, ideas that whose, whose time has already come. And, you yeah, know, it's how, a, a, they're paradigm shifts. That's uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, uh, definition of, a, of the paradigm shifts. And, 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 then, and, and yeah. And, th- and then you talked about the Swedish government and the epidemiologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, then you talked about live and let live, um, you know, possibly as a philosophy, but then also the expression itself and inside it, in Sweden, it being the ar- the opinion is like the arse divided. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the cashless society. Um, I can't remember how that happened, but it was to do with cooperation, I think. So the, the, the conditions were there for certain changes. Yeah, it, it, well... In Sweden, they don't have to make the the, the the changes that they're really grasping towards, particularly in Germany. Funnily enough, it's um, Britain and America aren't nearly as difficult a nut to crash in Germany. I think the reason they've had such a hard lockdown in Germany is that the Germans have an aversion to debt, which is visceral, not just from the Weimar Republic, but going back before then, it, it's... Um, I think it's something probably to do with Lutheranism um, and possibly Catholicism and, and the old Catholic and Catholic injunction against usury. Well, at um, the beginning, at the beginning of um, economic consequences of the of the peace, mm-hmm. obviously debt and the, and the spending, you know, that the debt comes with it. It all <laughs> goes hand in hand. The government spending, and he talks about the the growing of the cake. Mm-hmm. Uh, of how all of these people thought, you know, saving is good and, you know, not saving is bad. And then he says, but if you save, as you know, he says, but if you save, it means there's no money in the economy. But he said cracking that philosophy, as you say, in Germany is much harder today. Yeah. But of course, that's Keynes's view. And, 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 and he basically believed in some sort of directed economy with a state mandated currency. I spent a lot of time explaining to someone this morning the difference between a sovereign wealth fund and and, and a sovereign currency and how if you pay a universal basic income out of one or the other, what the differences are. And then also the differences between Minicum in Canada and the sort of uh, universal basic income coming down the pipe from the green fascists, uh, i.e. one has strings attached and Minicum never did. Um, and uh, so when Thomas Paine or Napoleon or even Mohammed, you know, peace be behold, upon him, when, when they all proposed a citizen's dividend, it basically is based on a birthright and the giving up of common rights to common holdings of land. Um, and, you know, they understood it. So a, it's a real Henry George type of point. Um, if you allow the enclosure of the common lands, so this is getting to the English Civil War, the diggers, the, you know, the, the chanters, all of that very, very interesting period in British history. Um, the, the, the idea that Karl Marx called it self-provisioning. Capitalism excludes self-provisioning. So again, this is where monopolies dictating public health policy for profit as opposed to public health policy being um, implemented by a non-political non-partisan um, uh, public servant but not politician like Andesh Tignal and and it's so so there's a real mishmash here um, you know th- there's the the rails that Swedish society and culture run on, which I find frustrating because I'm just a, you know, an old Welsh nonconformist um, and, and, and all that that entails. Whereas um, uh, within that non within that um, Lutheran on rails consensus based um, thing within the consensus, people will forgive each other a lot. And, and so and and, and 
and they're on the same page. And so it's easier to do things collectively in that culture. Um, it's easy to do things collectively in a non-conformist culture where you have subsidiarity and so where, where birds of a feather are flocking together. And so then you get into all, all of the Schumacher stuff about small is beautiful. Um, and of course, globalism, especially corporate globalism, is, the, is anti ethical to small is beautiful. Basically, might is right. Power and the pursuit of power is the end in itself for, you know, that, that strong global view, whether it's green on the left, green on the right, or whether it's, you know, extreme right or whatever you want to call it. Even in the centre, you know, the, the European centre, that extreme global view doesn't give the degrees of freedom um, because it the, the, the subsidiarity that's supposed to be built into the EU that is built into the American Constitution and is built into the British Constitution. It's subsidiarity is the key. Uh, I mean, subsidiarity is a key policy in the UK Green Party. They just don't observe it. It's centralised in London. It's very metropolitan. It's very, you know, it, it, it's always, the, oh, them down there in London. You know, uh, it's the most valid criticism in British politics of Westminster, and the Westminster book, but it is, it is them in London. That's what it is. Well, you know, Northern Ireland, Wales, Northern England, Scotland, it's a valid criticism. But it's the valid criticism of France as well with with um, with Par Parisians uh, and in Sweden to an extent to Stockholmers, but not quite so much. So, it, it, you know, I think there's um, there's a massive debate here to be had emerging out the other side of uh, this, 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 these these pandemic measures, shall we call them? Can I give you um, can I give you a small example of, of two of those things? Mm -hmm. um, you know how with fracking, uh, the local government minister sometimes would overrule the local council and mm -hmm. say we're fracking in the end. Obviously, they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, then also you had the issue of Jenrick with West Ferry. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, Tower Hamlets were dithering, but it's still that case of can central government override a local decision, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is the question. Uh, there's two things going on at the moment. I mean, one in particular, but the subject is interconnectors. Uh, there was a story in the FT this week saying that the longest interconnector, maybe in the world, I don't know, but it basically said there's an interconnector for electricity between Norway and Northumberland, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and they said it was for uh, wind power. Uh, and that is going up now. I think they finished it. It's about to go online or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was just there. And last Saturday, a friend of mine sent me a story about this chap, Alexander Tomerko, who was chairman of UCOS or something like that, and has been in Britain for 15 years, done a lot of donations to Boris and the Tory party. Um, but uh, he's got a company called Aquind, something like that, A-Q-U-I-N-D, mm -hmm. and he's doing an interconnector between Portsmouth and either Dieppe or La Havre, basically Normandy mm -hmm. and Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. The council have said they don't want it. And this is interesting. Penny Mordaunt, who was once defence secretary, mm -hmm. and I think she got dropped because she went for Hunt in the general, you know, in the leadership mm -hmm. campaign. But she's now paymaster general, so she's kind of in the cabinet, certainly in the government now. She is a minister of some mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, she's a mini uh, she's an MP for that sort of area, Portsmouth, and she has said that she's against it. So um, they've delayed the answer, but it's kind of interesting on a so quasi Quateng has to make the decision, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is. You know, it raises similar issues to do with local decision making and uh, mm. and government. That's it. I just wanted to mention it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, there's certainly interesting times. I mean, I talking about interconnectors and stuff like that. I, this is kind of a bit abstract from that, but the the transatlantic charter, this new American charter that Biden brought over. Oh yeah. Um, but also looking at the new Australian trade deal and yeah. what they're, they're smuggling through TTIP and TTP on the side. I'm dying to talk to David about it because obviously he knows a lot about TTIP and what have you. Yeah. Um, but it's almost now as if Brexit and Donald Trump have been written out the equation. Um, well, they have been written out the equation for the, uh, 
you know, for mainstream media or whatever, or mainstream discourse, certainly political discourse in Westminster, which which I think is very poor. Um, when you know, we're certainly not led by the brightest or best anymore. Um, we we have a political scene and a corporate scene that's dominated by those who have failed upwards. Like, well, can Andrew I just Bailey. say, yeah, on that on that point, um, when I was asking people for their views on TTIP during the Brexit campaign, and there were people giving out Remain flyers outside tube stations, mm -hmm. and I said. Can we just take a second to reflect upon the nature of TTIP, ISDS and mm -hmm. you know, like recognition and all of this type of stuff, GM food, all of the implications. Um, they all told me to go away, basically. And now I think some of those people are looking at the little bits that they're hearing about the Australia trade deal and acting like they're completely against it and mm -hmm. that they always would have been. But they didn't seem to be saying that when it was happening via the EU. Yeah, yeah but I'm I just saying the... that's where they fucked up massively. Because if they paid attention to David then, then it would have been different, I think. Yeah, well, I think the... Um, it could have been. I think what we're going to see is that you can't go from a democratic foot footing to full-on technocracy without people realising, hold on a second, what happened to that thing we used to have called democracy? And... Where that really comes out is that FT film the other day about the dystopian spying thing with 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 the um, with, with the black lady who was a yeah barrister. yeah yeah James uh, Graham yeah did you watch it right I, 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 well I I didn't finish watching I'm going to finish watching it today but I thought it's brilliant jo yeah, John he's really good on the slot. James Graham's really good yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it's where it was it's in the FT or, or on the FT online or something yeah they would yeah. Never am I right have done that yeah well well but that that's capitalism fighting back that this is my view i mean i'm part of the counter revolution the captain believe it, i never thought i'd find myself saying that i'm part of the capitalist counter revolution against this sort of um yeah derigism or, or it's worse than that this this state monopoly uh pseudo capitalism crony state right here we go here's one right state monopoly crony capitalism you know, that's what we've got. I mean, these guys, they're, they're kind of like cornflake packet fascists. You know, that's what they are. They're, they're, they're little fascist toys that you get in your cornflakes because they're, 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 they're just such gnome-like miniature, sort of small, intellectual, they're intellectual <laughs> pygmies, these people. Um, and, and what it is, is they're so used to having smoke blown up their ass that that you know their their thinking faculties uh, such that they ever existed appear to have evaporated you know in in, in the smoke of, 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 of you know um that's been blown up their ass by by their yeah. hangers you know by by their the lights their hangers on their, you know their disciples their their you know uh, their, their their bands of zealots you know it 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 is, but I mean, it is laughable. I mean, irony, absurdity, and just ripping the piss out of these people is what we've got. Grant Shapps, who the fuck is Grant Shapps? What a moron, right? And the, the other one, Matt Hancock, who the bloody hell is Matt? What a moron, you know, Boris, he's a bloody moron. The man I, I like watching him being wiped the floor with by Mary Beard. He's supposed to be this sort of classicist, this yeah. this very learned man. Well, the lie of that came out in the IQ squared debate or whatever it was, you know, at, at the Wigmore Hall. Well, I hope it was the Wigmore Hall because, you know, that that will be shown in, in, in the future of, of what a what a plastic sued. Uh, did I did I um, did I um, did you see that thing that I sent you just now? Uh, I haven't got the chat in the chat. Uh, OK, no, not just now. I did it about half an hour ago. The New York Times wrote an article about a year ago on the rise and rise of Michael Rimmer. Oh, cool. And they linked to your they linked to your YouTube video. You are not serious. Do you know what? You told me about that and I uploaded it. And there have been loads of comments and lots of people read it. Because do you remember we were talking? Yeah, yeah. About five years ago. Yeah. And now. Um, yeah. So, I mean, for some reason. Basically, in the FT today, you know how they have this thing called lunch with? 
Right. Today, lunch is with, it's in Moscow, and it's with Vladimir Surkov. I see. And I thought, no way. So, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah. so, I, so I, was do, I was doing a bit of research and that. Yeah. Um, and so then I noticed, you know, because it reminded me of Michael Rimmer, and then I saw, um, I saw that that was there. Uh, Amazing. And then, and then it said, look, check out the video. And I clicked on it and I thought, this is going to be Rogers, isn't it? It's got to be Rogers. And it had your name on it. It's funny. Um, Roger, are you going to be around later? Because I know that you've got other stuff on. Um, do you reckon tomorrow's a good time to catch up or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to the beach today, lady. So that's that's the plan. We're yeah. going to the Um. Yeah. So, yeah, can do. Um, so what are you off for walkies now or? Yeah, I'm off for walkies. I've got my acupuncture at 145. And in exchange, I do some help with some administrative and computing stuff that she needs doing. So, um, so yeah, I'm probably going to head off for walkies and then come back. Um, well, we can catch up later if you fancy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in a, a transitional phase. I, 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 I'm working very much on the construction side of our business at the moment and getting okay. our things sorted out so i'm having to you know just push a paddle across in my mind to get into that okay into that way of thinking and it, it, it's so tempting just to dive back into all of this politics stuff because it's you know it, it's such a sand piece of fun yeah <laughs> you know there's so many people to poke the fun, poke fun of um you know i, I it, it's uh yeah, you know, it's time to get back to business, you know, get the pubs fully open, get rid of all this quarantine nonsense. Um, you know, let, let, let's live our lives stood upright, you know, let's get off our knees and and, 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 and make, make, make the world a better place for everybody. And that's not what these people are trying to do. They're not trying to make the best put the world a better place yeah, for I took, anybody. I took, a, yeah, I took a couple of photos of some men in kilts yesterday. Ten o'clock as it was raining and I was in Paddington and... Um, you know, and then I got on the tube to go home and they basically said, yeah, we're on our way to Oxford Street. We're going to uh, turn the place upside down. So I thought, well, I'm glad I'm heading north and you're heading south uh, you know, on the tube. Um, yeah. On Twitter, it was, it was quite funny because you could see lots of people saying, you know, they, they tried to pass no comment, but they were just really upset that there were so many people there. And, yeah. and see, there was lots of rubbish on the floor, you know, far more than ever before than any would have ever seen. Mm. That's just because everyone's pent up and they're spending mm. money. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it's going to be 31 degrees here in Sweden today. It's a, after a really cold May, it's going to be beautiful. So we're all down to the beach today. We're going to go, go to the beach, have, 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 uh, have a nice afternoon on the beach, we will. All right, well, have a good one and I'll catch you yeah. maybe later, but probably tomorrow. Yeah. All right, then, Ranger. Take okay, care, mate. Enjoy. Cheers. Bye. Bye.